Hey, everybody, and welcome to another meeting of the Research Triangle PowerShell User Group. Tonight is June 16th. We are excited to have you here with us tonight. Uh, tonight, we are going to be talking about one of my favorite modules out there in the PowerShell community. We're going to be talking about the Import Excel module, and we have a very special guest with us tonight. Uh, before we get to our very special guest, let me welcome in my co-host. Hey, Phil, how are you? Good evening. How are you doing? All right. So, so I'm super excited about this topic too, because so much to topics about PowerShell is migrating data and working with data. And so this is super exciting, especially, you know, because everybody's, you know, database working with data, well, let's just throw it into Excel. So this is kind of super exciting on how you can truly use the power of shower, PowerShell to make Excel cower to your whims, I think. At least it does to me when I use it. So with that, let's welcome in our, our guest tonight. Hey, Doug, how are you? I'm doing everybody, well. Everybody say hello to Doug Finke. If you're not familiar with Doug Finke, you will be shortly. Uh -oh, Doug I'm going to have to stop you there. <laughs> it's, a, it's a silent E. Uh, oh, Fink. I'm sorry. Doug Finke. You know, I'm glad you said that because I have been saying Doug Finke for three years. So now I finally know. All right. So Doug Fink, we're very happy to have Doug with us tonight. For those who may not be aware, Doug is the creator of a module called Import Excel, um, which my personal opinion is should just kind of be included in the default install of PowerShell at this point. It's just probably the first module that I reach for after any config of PowerShell because I just use it every day. Um, so Doug, first of all, thank you for putting in the time and making this module. I think this is one of those modules that almost everyone in the community can relate to. Uh, so first of all, thank you for that. But let me ask you, how did you get the idea to build this module? That's great. Good question, and uh, thanks for uh, the warm welcome and the and the great uh, uh, accolades to the uh, the module. Um, I will chat about that, but I also do cover why why I um, why I built this and all that kind of stuff in my presentation. Yeah. So um, we can, we can, but that's a great thing, and I'll cover that like in the first couple of slides. And uh, okay, we'll go there. So how about this? Yeah. Um, along with being a very active community member and the creator of the Import Excel module. Doug is also a fellow community group leader. So why don't you tell us a little bit about the group that you run and how they can find out more about it? Sure, it sounds great. Um, yeah, so I run the New York City uh, PowerShell user group. Uh, I guess I've been doing it for about uh, five years. And we went on, we went virtual last year when the COVID hit. You can find us on Meetup. It's, uh, I can put this in the chat. It's the New York's NYC PowerShell Meetup. And in fact, next month we have Yap Brazer. He's going to be uh, talking and he's going to having fun with Azure Functions. So if you haven't worked with Azure Functions, it'll be a great place to uh, get your feet wet, uh, see what he has to talk about. Um, and just as as another commercial, I also have all my YouTube stuff uh, from the meetups up on my YouTube channel. I'll post this in the meetup as well, or in in, in Teams. Um, and we've had tons of great people as well. We had Jeff Hicks. Actually, we were talking about him earlier. He was he taught us how to teach PowerShell. And uh, actually, I think last week we had uh, Josh King on as well. I guess he's going to be doing his toast presentation for you folks as well. Mm -hmm. it, was really, it was really good. And as I tweeted out, it was kind of funny with, uh, with Josh. He started his presentation, and for some reason, his, the notifications weren't popping up. So it took several minutes, and he actually had to go to a video that he had recorded previously and used the video for his demo and then talk over the video. So it was uh, a pretty interesting, he pulled it out, uh, pretty impressive re uh, recovery. So that's my, the meetup in New York. I'll put that in the, in the chat and uh, that's a little okay. bit about that. Okay. All right, so, so let me ask you one quick question. This is almost like behind the scenes. Um, yeah. Do you happen to know if your group was added to the powershell.org calendar? I believe it is on there, but okay. uh, yeah. So, We'll double check. So, ladies and gentlemen watching at home, um, so our group, the Research Triangle PowerShell User Group, meets twice a month, and, and we have lots of great topics. However, the New York City PowerShell User Group is another very active group, and if you look at the list of topics that they have, they have a ton of great speakers. We would love it if you not only visited our group, but also visited the New York City group, as well as other groups, because there's lots of great community people out there doing great things. And sometimes it's a little hard to keep up with all this stuff. So two great ways that you can do this. Meetup.com is the way that most community user groups advertise their group. As, as um, Doug just advertised his group, 
uh, you can go to Meetup and you can subscribe to his group. And all that means is you'll get notified when they have an upcoming meeting. Um, but if you want an easy way to keep track of all the groups, you can go to powershield.org uh, slash calendar, I believe is the link. And mm -hmm. what that is, is that's a, an aggregator um, of community links and on a calendar. Uh, oh, I have, I have, I may have the wrong, the wrong yeah, link. I put it there. I, I just, yeah, I just, there it is. So, so what this is, is a number of the user groups have put their RSS feeds here, and it gives you one easy way to keep track of what's going on in the community um, by just coming to one calendar and having to, instead of having to chase a bunch. So if you want to see what's going on in the community with this group, the New York City PowerShell user group or others, you can come here. We also post things on here about PowerShell community events that are more than just user groups like PowerShell Summit or um, the, uh, the, the yeah, Twitter talks that we the Twitter, the Twitter talks that we do once a month. The point is PowerShell.org is a great, easy resource to use to keep up on what's going on with the, with, with the community. So with that being said, tonight we're going to be talking about Import Excel, and I think Doug also has some bonus content at the end on some things that he's been working on. Um, but with that, maybe we can just hand this over to Doug and let him do his thing. Great. All and right, Doug, so take it away. Thank you. All right. Really excited to uh, present this tonight. Uh, this has been a fun module to build. And uh, I guess just a little bit about me. Uh, I've been an MVP since 2009. Uh, I wrote a book called PowerShell for De Developers that's uh, a bunch of years old at this point though. And as we talked about, I'm an organizer of the New York City PowerShell group. And if you want, I'll put this up at, at the end. You can catch up with me on Twitter and you can get take a look at my stuff on GitHub. And there's my blog and I'll put that up at the end. So a little a quick history. So I've been using Excel. I'll date myself since it started competing with Lotus 1-2-3. So that's a few decades ago. And I, uh, so how I got into thinking about this, um, I always liked how Python could create visuals from programs. And early on in, in when I was using PowerShell back when it was called Monad, as it went into, and then PowerShell when it went to version one, there weren't ways to do certain visualizations with PowerShell early on. Um, it's, as time went on, PowerShell 2, PowerShell 3, Folks like James Brundage wrote WPK, where you could actually do WPF applications in uh, PowerShell. And then Jay Cool, Joel Bennett actually started doing some things and uh, to do uh, WinForm type work and do WPF. Those two guys merged their stuff into something called Show UI that was around for a while. Anyway, so there wasn't really easy ways to do visualizations and pop them up as windows. Anyway. So CSV, CSV files are great, but I wanted an easier way to have automated integration with Excel. And this module started out as a way for me to import stuff from Excel uh, files. And that was why I called it Import Excel. And I threw it up in GitHub and I put it up on the gallery. And then I started getting more ideas. Uh, and then we started putting exports on it and all kinds of other things. Uh, and really today it should be called Excel++. Um, just as a note, it's, Import Excel also runs on Windows, Linux, and Mac. Uh, and you can also use this in Azure Functions and GitHub Actions, which I may be able to show some, some of those pieces. Well, not Azure Functions, but maybe some GitHub Actions later. And if you present reports to management in Excel, this module will make your life real, really easy and you can automate a lot of stuff. So quick shout out, lots of contributors to my module over the years. Bug fixes, examples, extending PowerShell, uh, Excel capabilities adding uh, testing harnesses and more. Somebody in the chat said, well, you should get James O'Neill on here to talk. I agree with that. James uh, used to work for Microsoft. Uh, when I first built this, um, James would message me and, and he would always threaten that he was gonna add stuff to my module. And then after I got to a, a big enough base in my code, he actually began to contribute some significant, really cool ideas. He's a really, he, the way he thinks about PowerShell modularization, all that kind of stuff, I've learned from him. He learns from me. Uh, he'd be a great guy to have on. That's his Twitter handle. Uh, definitely follow him. And if you get up on his GitHub, he's even doing stuff with um, Microsoft Graph right now. That's really cool. So he's worth uh, following and following his work as well. So why Excel? Uh, best way to store data. Uh, used by over 750 million people. You can perform all kinds of calculations in, in Excel. You can calculate time differences, compound interest, um, count unique values, quarter formulas. You can do tons of things, not even scratching the surface of what you can do. Lots of tools for data analysis. I love playing with data. 
uh, grouping dates in pivot tables, doing conditional formatting, running total columns in pivot tables. We might see some of that tonight. It's easy to do visualizations in Excel, and you can print these reports out if people still print. You can store data with lots and lots of row, rows, and you can work with Excel online, Office 365, or on mobile apps. So uh, I picked one of these lines off of what Mike said on Twitter a few weeks back. Uh, and I love it when, you know, what you love, I love when the reaction that people get when someone asks, requests Active Directory data, and I give them back an Excel spreadsheet formatted as a table with rows, colors, title, and name tabs in less than two minutes. You can actually achieve that. Also, other people, I give the Office 365 uh, license information in different spreadsheets within a single file with well formatted tables. Um, this is just some of the testimonials I've had over time. Um, building this module, I started it as a, I like to start projects that are just fun, that I can experiment with, that I can put in a sandbox. Sometimes I'll just keep them local on my machine. If it starts gaining traction with me, I'll put it up in GitHub. If it starts taking shape, I'll start publishing into the gallery and then letting people know about it. So Doug, yeah. a point about that. So <clears throat> something that I think, and obviously that we'll see this when you get into your demos, but one thing that people may not realize is we're all, we're all making reports that we give to management and many people are doing dumping to CSVs and then they're opening it in Excel and then, you know, changing it to an XLS file and they're giving it to management. And they may be wondering like, okay, import Excel, sure, that makes it a little easier. What I think a lot of people may not realize, and they'll see it in the demos, is when, like with that quote I made, it makes you stand out when you give a report that not only is formatted really nice, but has all the little things in Excel that people come to expect, like alternating row colors, a title, you can name the tabs as you like, as you said, graphs, pivot tables. So it's more than just making an Excel spreadsheet. There's so much that you can do with this tool. And I know you're gonna cover all this in the demo, but I'm just saying this early on for the people yep. that are just not even sure of why there's an, an Excel module. It's not to create an Excel spreadsheet. It's to create an Excel spreadsheet with all the advanced things that you can do in Excel from the command line. And that's yep. what we'll see shortly. But if you've never seen this module, this is something you're gonna definitely have to spend time with because it can take you from being just like an average person who produces reports to someone that makes reports that shine when you give them into your direct, to your managers and to, you know, to upper level people. It really makes an impact and it makes you stand out in the job that you do. That's, that's a great point. Thanks for uh, pointing that out. It, it, when you can produce those kind of Excel reports and we'll see some of them, uh, it ups your credibility. And uh, there's some folks on Twitter that I often see, they always say, oh, I did this great thing. I created a CSV file and I handed it off to, to management so they could open it in Excel. And I'll always poke those folks and I'll say, hey, you should use import Excel. You can make it look really good. And their response is typically, well, that's their, that's not my pay, you know, that's not my pay grade. I don't do that. I let them have that problem. And then we have some more conversations and it's like, well, if you use this, look what you can do. And you just look that much more valuable to the people around you. If it's the thing you like to do and, and play with data and do cool reports. But we'll take a look at that. Um, let's jump into the demo if we're ready. So tonight I'm gonna to use Visual Studio Code and I'm gonna use something called um, interact.net interactive notebooks. Um, so I don't know how many if people are familiar with VS Code. Uh, I prefer it as an editor. There are challenges with it with PowerShell. Uh, if you're coming from ICE, uh, ICE is uh, a little more stable in certain ways, uh, but the PowerShell team is working really well on solving all those issues. Anyway, so this is a what they call a, uh, a interactive notebook. I'm not going to go too deep into it, um, and I just want to give the uh, make the statement that this is new technology. So I'm hopefully it's not going to fall on its face because I'm using some of the newer bits. But what you can do with this is um, each one of these things is called a cell. So you can see a piece of code in here. I'll show what this is in a second. This cell is actually as if I was typing on the command line, but I can execute each cell independently. And I'll be able to execute these different cells as we go along and you'll see how that works. And it's like having the console up, but it's actually like executable documentation. So here you can see that I have uh, images intermixed with code. 
which is really slick. If I double click on this one on top, for example, it's actually marked down. And when I run that markdown, it actually renders everything. So I'm not going to go too deep on that, uh, but I'm going to use it. And I'm, I, I tried this out earlier today. It all worked and it should work tonight. So where can you go to get the Excel module? Well, you can go on to the PowerShell gallery. You can do an install module hyphen name import Excel. Um, this has had about 893,000 downloads. We're, coming in on a million downloads, which is cool. Uh, I put out a new version in a month ago and it got 65,000 downloads in the, in the last month, um, which is very exciting as an author. And you can also check it out on GitHub. So here's the actual code uh, where I check things in, I make changes, I'll create branches and I'll spike ideas and uh, also we'll get uh, things from the community that we'll try out. The thing I wanna draw your attention to here is there is an examples directory. And these have been collecting these examples for years of how to use the module, different ways to do things, how to do merge worksheets, how to do mortgage calculators, how to do multiplier tables, um, interacting with all the modules, importing HTML straight, in, straight into uh, Excel. So this is a great source of how do you work with this tool? What can it do? So check out the examples. The other thing is uh, bring your attention to issues. If you have a problem or you, you're not sure how something works or something doesn't seem to be working correctly, you can open an issue call it, and it's a problem. You can also come here and you can search. There's a, over a thousand issues that people have talked about over the years. You might find your solution in here if you search the uh, issues uh, part. So it's a, another great resource. There are people up on Stack Overflow that actually ask questions and answer questions on Import Excel as well. So that's another good resource. So, so, so Doug, yeah. so that examples thing that you showed on GitHub, first of yeah. all, that's fantastic. That is separate from the built-in help with the module. Those are examples that are different than the, the included examples for the module? Exactly. Okay, so because I didn't even know that, and I'm a heavy user of your module, that's awesome to come there and look like some of the advanced stuff. And I was just thinking to myself, I'm like, and this is why I'm bringing it up. Like, like, did you ever think, and I'm not saying this to you because you've done the module, you know it, but just in general, everybody, did you ever think you could run a mortgage calculator from the command line in PowerShell, right? So, like, the power of this tool is really pretty amazing. And uh, we're not going to go through this as an example, but this actually builds out a mortgage calculator, and you can then interact with it. Once you build it once, it takes some defaults for the amount, interest, and term. And then you can actually go in, you'll be inside of Excel, and then you can do all the kinds of mortgage calculations as well. Yes. Yeah, pretty interesting stuff. So lots of cool, lots of cool examples. But the, the point really with this module is this module is one of those modules that is really is limited by your imagination. Well said. Yeah. Absolutely. In fact, and that's it's, that's 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 absolutely true because there are people I get questions either on the GitHub repo or I get a lot of emails, people asking about things. And it'll spark things for me like, oh, wow, I never thought, never thought of trying to use it that way. So, uh, yeah, lots of cool stuff. Um, cool. So let's kick off. And so just to show you some of the uh, cool pieces about interactive notebooks, um, even though I'm not going to explain what interactive notebooks are too much, is I wrote a thing called Get Giphy so, um, as a PowerShell function. So, get, uh, so if you go up on Giphy, you can see the different uh, Giphy's that you can, well, you can search for them through the website or you can do it in certain tools like on Slack and then you can post them. So I wrote one that actually goes out against the endpoint on Giphy. It's a REST endpoint and you can actually send a query like you say, okay, I want to search for all Giphy's that are rockets and I pull back 25 and then I randomly pick one and then I display it right here in line inside the, um, inside the actual dot, interactive.net. Uh, That's notebook. cool. And I can run it again, hopefully get a different one. And then we can change over and we want to search for matrix. So this is kind of the cool up and coming pieces. Um, oh, Martix, let's try matrix. <laughs> and so this is the kind of interactivity that you can have and you can then, What's nice is I will put this up on my GitHub and then you can actually download this notebook, this file. And if you have .NET Interactive Notebooks installed in Visual Studio Code, you can actually now use this and you can actually click the run button here on the left and actually interact with um, what's been built inside of here, if that makes sense. So a little bit more down the path, why did I, why did I do this? So 
as I mentioned before, um, this is a Python library. This is a simple um, Python script. And they have really cool ways you can do visualization. And if you squint really hard, it looks a little bit like PowerShell. So for example, I'm going to do, instead of an import module, you can do an import on mat, uh, matplotlib.pyplot. And that just says, pulls that information in, that pulls in that module that can do uh, plotting. It, this is uh, an array. So if you did a dollar X and like that, that's PowerShell. And this is the Python syntax. So I'm going to set up some X values and Y values for a graph. And then I'm going to plot those X, Y values. Then I'm going to add a label to the X, X axis and a label to the Y axis. We're going to put a title in and then I'm going to actually show it. So I can actually get a terminal down here in inside of Visual Studio Code. And I'm going to, I'm going to try to do the simple plot. And this is what used to really interest me about Python. So from the command line, I can run these things and I can get all kinds of graphs. This is really simple stuff, but you can get very complicated in the, in the depth of the graph that you want, 3D type stuff. You can annotate all kinds of different things. And I was like, wow, I'd really love to have that in PowerShell. So that was kind of the genesis for me, what I wanted to start doing. Now, we're not going to just jump into Excel stuff yet. So just for uh, folks that may or may not know, what uh, when I was thinking about doing for uh, doing graphs and doing visualizations, I was like, okay, well, I can get to the .NET framework, right? So for example, I can get to math, the, the namespace inside the .NET framework, and I can get to what they call a static function by using colon, colon, and I can call math tangent, or I can call the sine and divide that by the math cosine of 30, and these should give me the same number, but I'm, it shows that I'm actually reaching inside of to the .NET framework, which is a pretty, um, several thousand classes of stuff that I can do. So it's like, okay, well, maybe I can build my own graphing tool. Another thing you can do, I don't know how many folks are aware, um, this is a C sharp, right? In a side of a here string, right? So I'm actually gonna create a class. This is a valid C sharp. I'm gonna create a class called test X. I'm gonna create a method called add. It takes two parameters and it adds them up and it returns them. And by using the add type, which is built into PowerShell, I'm going to compile that C-sharp on the fly, and then down here, I'm going to do a new object on the name of that class, and then I'm going to call the add method, and I'm going to pass the number two, three, four, five to it and add it to the number six. So, so that actually compiles the C-sharp on the fly and did, and then added uh, two plus six, three plus six, so on and so forth. So with this kind of thinking, I was like, okay, well, maybe I, if I can extend things with C-sharp and I can call into the .NET framework, maybe I can build a tool. So first I came, I was like, all right, this was back in the days when, before we, uh, we were doing different things and Microsoft, the PowerShell team offered up something called COM objects, which have been around for since Excel was invented. And COM stands for a component object model. So in actuality, what I can do here is I will new up a com object with that application name, Excel application, and then I'm going to say Excel dot visible equal true. So once I do this new object, I actually have control of Excel from PowerShell, uh, and I can actually work with its object, uh, its its object model. So let's run this, and hopefully yes. So now you can see, can can you see that, or is it too small? We're all good. I think go. that's good. Yeah, it's fine. Yeah. Okay. So keep your eye on the Excel over here. So no, what I did within two lines of code is I actually instantiated Excel. So it's actually running in the background. It's running on my machine. And then I said, okay, make it visible so we can see it. Next, watch what happens when I do this line. I'm going to say dollar Excel. I'm going to say on the property workbooks, I want to do an A. I use the method add and watch what happens in Excel. So keep an eye on the Excel. So it actually creates a workbook and it creates a sheet. So I'm going to grab that sheet. I'm going to go index into that array, grab sheet one. This gets really cool. I'm going to poke values into it. So now I want to take that worksheet and I want to go against the cells. I want to go row one, column one, which is a, which is a one cell. The next one, I'm going to go row one, two, three, four, and five. So I should get a bunch of data across the top in the first row from columns A, I think to E. Let's see what happens. So I'm going to run this, but keep an eye on the Excel. So I'm actually poking values into Excel. So I'm actually controlling it. So 
Um, I could be doing this from the command line, typing one line at a time, or I can have an entire script that does it. So let's add a couple more records. Let's add a data record. Okay. Now what, what gets really interesting here is I'm actually poking values in, but the last one, notice I'm poking in a formula equals C2 times D2. So if I double click on, on that, Excel pokes that value in as a formula, but then it actually calculates it for me. So it's like, wow, this gets really interesting. I can do it again and notice that value gets calculated for the hammer and we'll do one more and the value gets calculated for saw. So that's like my first attempts were like, okay, so let me control everything from the command line. One of the problems is, is that if I'm going to put something like thousands of rows of data, the screen keeps updating. So I'd have to turn out how to figure out how to turn a screen off. I would have to actually learn how to save the file. Um, Excel is an older model when it comes to com objects. So you have to do marshalling and all this other kind of stuff to save it properly. Um, and this is, gets very brittle because a user might see this happening. And then if they click on it, it actually interrupts the automation. So that becomes problematic, but you can do some really cool things this way. So based on the Python doing graphs, and then I can actually reach into the .NET framework and build C sharp classes. There were some options and I was like, okay, com objects were nice. Well, now what? So as Mike mentioned before, some people actually do export, um, they'll export things to CSVs and then use that inside of Excel. So let's take a look at this. I'm gonna just get the services on my machine and I'm going to use the built-in export CSV and create a file. So can I ask you there, uh, Doug, yeah. with, you, you kind of give it an example of using com objects and stuff like that, but when you're dealing with your module, which we'll probably get to later, is it's a lot easier, but you can do that, but you know, to be able to reference those column names like A, B, C, D, and you know, column F, F, there's not really an easy way to do that, right? Other than just indexing it them directly, right? With my module? No, no, I mean, just the Conway or kind of thing. So the ref question um, yeah. like in the chat was, hey, can you just reference it like column A, column C? Um, right. you can't, I've only you, seen you, it done that way. Yeah, you, numbers, you have to do that's why. Exactly. It, you, uh, in fact, in, inside of my um, Excel module, I have a way that you can convert, like if you want to go to, you know, um, cell YY27, it'll actually convert it to a row column for you. Uh, I'll, so you can actually call a function, pass that in and get the row column. But yeah, you can do row column uh, type. Ad, you can address it as a row column type thing, you know, A1, A50. Um, but you can't do it with the module and you can't do it with com. You can do it inside of Excel though, but I have ways that you can do the conversions backwards and forwards. Cool. Thanks. Cool. Good question. So, so here we'll do this again. So I, I just did a get service and I exported it to a CSV file. So we created that. Now, if I want to open that in Excel, I could just run, you know, do an invoke item or just launch the file that way. And that puts all, you know, that's like, like, well, great. Look at that. I didn't have to worry about it. It was fast. I have 313 rows. Um, we're all good to go. Now, the problem with it is, let's say I wanted to do something like, well, I'm going to get rid of this column. Um, I can go in here and I can say insert, or let's go back to data and I'm going to create a filter. So filters in Excel are really cool if you don't know about them. So it actually says it does a unique, uh, it takes all the values in that column and does a unique on it. Right. And then I can come in and say, well, just show me all the blanks and then it will subset your data. That's pretty cool. And then that's the way you want to look at certain kinds of information. Now I can save this file. And we'll save it back as the, the CSV. Now the problem is if I reopen it, it loses all of its formatting, right? Because it's a CSV file. And this goes back to what Mike was saying. People can do this, so you can generate all these files with PowerShell, but then you have to come in here and you have to do a file and do a save as, and you do a browse and you get to where you want. And then you have to come in and do XLSX, and then you can start manipulating your data. And then you have, oops, and then you have to come in and start manipulating the CSV itself. Like if I want to put on filtering and all that, that's all manual effort. And you know, we're automators, so we want to do it all at the command line, or we want to do it in scripts. So the, while that works, it's really not, I don't, I didn't like it. it didn't, didn't really achieve what I was, was going after. So let's take a look at our first shot at export Excel. Now I'll just say at the top as well, what's cool about this module as well is, and it did, what's cool is that um, 
you don't need to have Excel installed on your machine to make this happen. Um, and we'll show you a couple of ways that that works. You do need Excel installed if you want to view the file, but when you want to create the files, you don't need to have Excel installed, which is a has a lot of benefits and a, handles a lot of different scenarios, which we'll talk about in a bit. So let's take the same thing we just saw with, with when we generated the CSV file, and let's do a get service, and we're going to say export Excel. So I modeled export Excel after the same concept of export CSV, where you can just say, here's an array of ob PowerShell objects, and they all have properties, throw it at another function, and export Excel will then um, inspect that information coming across the pipeline, figure out the property names, figure out how much stuff is being sent, and then sets up Excel for you. So here we are. We're just going to take get a service, and let's see what the defaults give us and what comes up in Excel. So I'll run that. Same and so right off the bat, we can see some interesting cool pieces. So I'm going to delete this column so we can better read it. So already you see that there's zebra coloring. So we get colorization, alternating colors out of the box. These are the defaults and they're all changeable. Uh, it comes up with the filtering. So now when I sit here and say, okay, I just want to see uh, blanks. and I just want to see ones that are true. Now you're gonna to have to believe me because I did, when you do create uh, the Excel sheet like this with no parameters, I automatically generate a temporary file name for you. And I'm not gonna go look for that, but if you actually save this, so I'll save this file. When you opened it back up, we'll see that in the next demo. When you open it back up, all this formatting all the filtering that, that was done by the user is preserved over every time that you open up the file. So that already to me is a, a benefit over CSVs. So, yes. So um, there is plenty more to come in this demo, but I almost want to say to people, like if you only took away one thing from this demo tonight, you can install import Excel and without doing anything, you can then run export Excel and it'll auto format an Excel spreadsheet with the most common settings that most people use. And then of course you can customize it whatever you want. But I mean, very literally, that is what I do probably three times a day. I have my own custom configs that I use for your module, but sometimes I just do simple export Excel and I let it make a temp file and then I just save it somewhere because it's like super fast, super quick and easy. And even if I just use the temp file and save it to a file, that's usually good enough to send as a report. Exactly, exactly. And it, it goes back to the, uh, the philosophy of PowerShell, trying to pick the, uh, the, the right set of um, parameters that you set so it just works out of the box. And uh, I think we've gotten there with the export Excel. So yep, if you take any object, that, any array, any array that has PowerShell objects in it, throw it at ex export Excel, see what you get, and you're off to the races. And now I'll show you how it breaks down and you can be more modular with it. Um, cool. So here, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to do, see, we'll see this again and again. I'm just going to grab some target data, get the processes on my machine, and I'm just going to grab company name and handles. I'm going to create a title and a variable, and now I'm going to use export Excel and I'm going to tell it I'm where I want to create the file and I can name the file. I'm going to pass in the title. I'm going to use something called table name processes. That's what gives you the colorization and the filtering and a, and a few other things under the covers. And I'm also going to say auto size. So when you throw data at this, sometimes the default is, is that uh, Excel picks whatever. 15 is the width. Uh, and you're going to have certain columns that where the data is wider and narrower. And if you, if you do auto size as a switch, it will take care of it for you and figure out how to properly size it for you. So we run this. And notice nothing comes up, right? So I've in fact actually created the file but it didn't display. We'll talk about that. So I'm going to use invoke item in, an, in, an, as in the next line or in the next cell, and we'll launch that. So there's the title, right? Pick time and date as being now. And then I got the colorization. And I got the filtering. So, and like Mike says, like, so some simple uh, sets of parameters and this can be a report that you can send off and ready to go. So let me remove that file. So when I'm developing a report, okay, 
the default for export Excel is not to show the file. And the reason for that is I can actually, when I'm done, if I don't have the hyphen show, I can take this script and throw it up on a server and I can run it on a server. I can run it as a scheduled task. Um, it'll just keep creating files all day long or as whatever schedule you run it on. Uh, I can put it into an Azure function and have it generating um, Excel spreadsheets in an Azure function and in many other places. So by not by default, it doesn't show. So if you have to use a show switch, so we can run this one again. And now once the file's created, it launches. Now notice I don't have any coloring, I don't have any filters, and I don't have any auto sizing, right? So that's what it looks like if you don't use any, if you specify show or you specify the file name, it doesn't give you the rest of the parameters. It, it lets you, you have to start setting things. So let's go a little deeper. All right. And then I'm not going to run this again, but basically this, this takes you through the workflow of, okay, I can create the, I can create this data, put it in a file. I don't have to show it. And then I can pay, I can email this file around or whatever. I, I can store it on a SharePoint, et cetera. So this approach is good when you want to run a script on a server in an Azure function and a GitHub action, you can uh, create your file and it's ready for distribution. Let's talk about conditional formatting. This is a fun one. Fun, I, I enjoy it. Um, so now I'm going to go and move over to get service and I'm just going to grab uh, four properties out of it. Status, name, display name, and start type. And I'm going to export it to a test SLX. I'm going to auto size and we'll show it. So we'll get us see the raw data. So that's just me grabbing my services and some information about it. So let's do some conditional formatting with that. So I'm going to grab the same data again. Inside of import Excel, there's a function called new conditional text and you can pass it. Well, what text do you want to do conditionals on? So anywhere it finds the word stop in any of the, the cells inside the spreadsheet, it's going to colorize it. And so I'm going to take that data, type it to export Excel, auto size it, do a show. And then there's a parameter. You can pass in that conditional text you created in, into the conditional text parameter. So let's see what it does. Run that. Now notice it just colorized the words. It finds the word stop. I did. Uh, I set this up as a conditional text in the engine of Excel, but that's all you need to do, right? And it will now color, it colorize any place it found the word stop. I just happen to know that stop is only in column A. If you know how to use Excel, you can click on conditional formatting. You can look at the manage rules. Uh, and so I leverage all of the conditional aspects inside of Excel in this module and everything inside of um, it. It also does IntelliSense or it does tab completion. So you don't have to look these things up inside of Excel. It'll show it to you when you use the actual function. So you can see here, this is looking for specific text containing the word stop. And this is the, how you can colorize it. And we'll take a look at how you can modify that as well. So let's do multiple conditional. So we'll take that same set of data again, but now I want to apply three conditional texts. I want to do it on stop anywhere it finds the text R U N N and anywhere you find SVC. When it does find R U N N, I'm going to make the text color blue and the background of that text that cell cyan. If it finds SVC in the text, it's going to color the text wheat and it makes the background color green of that cell. We've seen this before. We pipe the data, we auto size it. We're going to show the file when it's done and conditional text take, can take an array. So let's fire that up. So out of the box, there you go. So we can see running is uh, colorized that way. And here we can see that SVC is in, it happens to be in column C for this row and here. So now we can, you can play around with this. You can put several different conditional texts together, highlight your data, make it look like a Christmas tree, whatever you want to do. Like you might want to come in here and show that everything that's um, automatic or disabled, you want to do it in red. So there's lots of ways that you can play with this. In addition, which I'm not going to demonstrate, I don't think. Hey, Doug. Yeah. So I noticed that like looking for the tech service is looking across the whole spreadsheet. What if you wanted to limit it to a single column? So I only was looking for SVC in the name column. Great question. And I was, I was just going to say, I'm not going to demo that, but yes. <laughs> <laughs> but let's try over here. Um, so you have conditional, there should be a range parameter on here. Yeah. 
So you can specify a range and you can say, okay, I only want uh, C, uh, I only want column C, right? Or I only want from C1 to C50, something like that, okay? And that'll limit, that range will then say, if only if you find stop in this range, then we're gonna colorize it. Does that make sense? This is so useful. Perfect. Awesome. All right, moving on. So let's get rid of that file. Let's play with some conditional icons. I have fun with those as well. This module was a lot of fun to build. Anyway, um, so now I'm gonna switch up the data. We're gonna get process, and I'm gonna just grab company name, physical memory handles, and I'm gonna grab any property with uh, star mem in it. Like star, uh, any any property with a, that had contains mem inside of it, just uh, as getting the data. Instead, now what we're gonna do is we're gonna do new conditional formatting icon set. And here you can see on the icon set, I'm actually telling it, I only want column C. So co company's column A, name's column B, and PM is column C. I wanna do three icon set, and I wanna do icon arrows. Now, I mentioned before, I surface all of the, um, the data here or the options from inside of Excel at the command line. So this is actually picking up all the different possible icon sets that Excel can do. And you can same thing with icon types. So this is actually using dynamic parameters inside of PowerShell. Uh, so if you want, you can actually grab the source code that is up on the GitHub. If you wanna see how this is done, how I actually pull this out into dynamic parameters, it's a really useful technique uh, it's a little complicated, but it's a lot. It makes your, again, it makes your, your functions and your scripts really shine. So icon type is other dynamic, dynamic parameter. So you can pick what you want. It shows you everything that's possible for a three icon set. So if I come over here and I change this to, oops, and again, a five icon set, you can see there's different types of icon types. So it's super helpful at the command line. You don't have to memorize this stuff. You don't have to go inside of Excel to figure it out. Anyway, so we're gonna grab all the processes. We're gonna export the data as we've seen before, but now we're instead of doing conditional text, we're gonna do a conditional formatting. And we pass that variable over yonder. So let's run this. So I'm not gonna get too deep now. What, what's really cool is now you can see these arrows in the, in the PM all right, and you can see we have tons of data here, but we've only limited that formatting to column C for physical memory. And what it does is, try it again, manage the rule. Hmm, that's interesting. Let's try to work so that, there we go. Edit this rule. It actually applies these different arrow types um, based on what values are. And all that is settable from the export Excel command uh, with the new conditional format icon set. So you can set all these values. So if you wanna have different ways to show different arrows for different values, when it's above 67, below 67, below percentiles, this is actually percents. All this stuff is available uh, in the new conditional formatting icon set. So you can go to town on how you wanna show your data. And it gets pretty complicated, so I'm not going to go through it too much more detail. Question? Well, let me just chime in. Uh, yeah. It's not a question, but let's just give people a reminder. If you go back to that notebook you have behind you, right? Yeah. Think about this in practical terms. So Doug's producing some pretty complex spreadsheets here. And obviously, you may not know every one of these parameters right now, but we're, we're essentially looking at three lines of code, right? Three lines of code produces these custom sheets and obviously it could be less but so when you hear this idea that like I could create a spreadsheet in Excel and it could do all these really crazy things it doesn't mean you have to write 150 lines of code to make it do that the tool one of the really useful things about the tool is it's almost just a pipe and the commandlet name and you have your tool and you can add on some params it's really just an addendum to the work that you've done already. You don't have to go ahead and write a 200 line script to make this like amazing spreadsheet. I'm talking about like two, three, four lines of text. And mm -hmm. in many cases, just one commandlet if you're fine with the defaults. Exactly correct. Uh, absolutely. 
And you can then also wrap, you can take these functions and you can make your own abstractions into your own functions. And that's a little more advanced that do even more, you know, that apply those formatting and those defaults for you on top of Excel, the export Excel commands. Cool. So in case anybody hasn't seen it, and I know that not, people aren't going to see it on the YouTube video, but um, so I had, was talking to Doug back right before I asked him to speak to the group about, hey, I love your module. I'm looking to do some stuff. And I actually did some of what he's saying. I basically put some default parameters that I use for myself in my PowerShell profile, and I just save it as a variable, and then I can just call it on the command line. And I pasted that in the chat in case anybody has seen it. But I have one, two, three, four, just five default values in there, so I don't have to keep typing those same defaults every time. I can just do export Excel, and then I can use the temp file. Or if I want to use my values, I just bring it in as a as a, uh, a splatted table, there you go. Uh, a splat, and then, you know, so once you find the set of parameters that you like, it's not even the case of having to type it over and over again. You can save it in your profile or use PS default parameters, and, and you can recall that very easily. Absolutely. And that's the beauty of PowerShell. So once you get the data inside of PowerShell, and then you start using it, and you can build these kind of modules or use these sorts of modules, this thing just lights up, and, and you can do all kinds of magical things with it. Cool. So now the, the next one I want to show is you can actually combine conditional formatting and conditional text. So we can take the same set of data. We're going to do those arrows again. And, but now we're also going to look for the word Microsoft anywhere inside of the spreadsheet. And we're going to color wheat and green. So yeah, you can start mixing and matching all kinds of cool stuff. Um, excellent. All right. So let's go to the other side of the table. And that's that's how you can, so that's how you can create um, that's a, we're barely touching the surface on this thing of what you can do with export. But uh, the other thing is like a lot of times I know I have to read the uh, data from Excel. Okay, so let's take a look at how that gets done. So I over here I have a um, I have a, a directory a subdirectory here and I have a bunch of uh, spreadsheets in here for the it's let's take a look at one. Let's see if I can open this up. Sales data. Let's open up April. So this is just some sales data. Has a transaction ID, a store status, and some other information. It's got a hundred rows, and each one of these are set up the same. So we have uh, January through December uh, sales data for each one of these stores, um, and they each have a sheet one in them. So I have another function in the module called get Excel summary file, which uh, is super useful. So I'm going to do a DIR on the sales data, right? And that's going to bring back all these different file names. And I'm going to pipe that into get Excel file summary, and we'll just format it right here. And what's what's what this shows you is that it shows you the name of the file, shows you how many worksheets. So if there was more than one worksheet, it would repeat, you know, April one, April sheet one, April sheet two, it tells you how many rows is in that in that particular sheet. Uh, how many columns, it gives you the address, and it gives you the file name. And this becomes, it's a good way to, if you're de in dealing with a bunch of different spreadsheets and Excel files, it's a good way to get a sense of, well, what's going on with these things that I want to work with. Okay, let's clear that output. So now we know. So now what I'm going to do is I can actually do an import Excel, which is another function inside this module, uh, and I'm going to point it at a spreadsheet. By default, import Excel, if you don't tell it what worksheet name uh, that you want, it, it will always go after the first one in the, in the, in the workbook. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to op crack open the uh, February worksheet and I'm going to grab the first five rows. I'm going to crack open the August worksheet, uh, workbook, and then I'm going to look at the first uh, five uh, rows there. And what's really cool with PowerShell with the object flow engine is that it figures out, oh, everything has the same headers. So it just gives me back, uh, 10 rows, five from each, and it looks like I'm looking at um, consistent data. So I model this all after import CSV, right? So you can do the same thing with import CSV. You can, if you have uh, CSV files that have similar headers, et cetera, you can open up multiple ones and then you can just put that all into an array. You can just import all 10 CSV files and you're good to go. So import Excel works the same way and it too has a whole bunch of um, parameters that you can deal with. Let's see what else we can do with it. Now, let's say somebody came along and said, hey, Doug, you know, this is great. We have all this uh, sales data for all the different places, for all the different stores. But what I'd like is I'd like to have one spreadsheet 
called yearly sales. And um, I want to have one spreadsheet with all the sales. And I don't want to, I want to have each one of those workbooks, the individual, I want them as tabs inside of Excel. So that makes sense. So I want to take all those different uh, workbooks and I want to put them all in one and each month is a separate tab. Well, that might look a little like a blot here, but I'm going to read, I'm going to do a get item, get child item on sales data, grab all those files, grab that workbooks, the base name. So I'll get April, May, June, July, August. Uh, I'm going to import Excel and I'm going to export that data that I pull in. I'm going to create this uh, one book, one workbook called yearly sales. And the worksheet name is going to be the name of the, of the file name I pull in. We'll auto size it. And at the end of it all, I don't want to do a hyphen show on this because each workbook that I would read, I would then be opening the file 12 times, right? One for each book that I process. So I'm just going to process it. And at the end, I'm going to open it when it's all done. So let's see what we got. So we're going to grab all that data. And if you see down here, I just read all of that data down at the bottom. You can see the tabs, August, December, February. So I just pulled in all those separate Excel files and made them same data, pulled all the data in and created separate tabs. I hope I hear everybody saying, wow, that's pretty cool. Now. Uh I'm still blown away by that Excel file summary thing. I wish I knew about that. <laughs> well, that's a that, that's I had a I had a, this is the new and improved version. Um, but yeah, go ahead. It, it, I recently added it. I think that the the one I've done just added in the last month. So yeah, check that out. So now the same person comes. So we're going to run this again. Um, yeah, run this one more time. So now somebody comes along and says, "Hey, Doug, that's great. We got all the all those different worksheets now." Depending on where you work, I know a lot of people that work with spreadsheets from lots of different vendors and whatnot, and they have to kind of consolidate this stuff. So this is a technique that you can use to consolidate information in Excel. But then somebody comes and says, hey, you know, it's really too bad we don't have that like January, instead of this format, I want to sort it by, by month. And it's like, okay, well, let's say the file's already been created, which we did. And uh, there's something inside of, uh, there's another function called add worksheet. And we're going to look at three different functions. We're going to look at open Excel package, add worksheet, and close Excel package. Open Excel package is cool because it lets you, you can point it at a, um, a workbook and it opens it up and then you can work with the Excel object model. In addition, when you, and when you're done with that, you can then close that package and it saves it for you when you do the close. And it also supports the hyphen shell. The add worksheet takes that Excel package and then I can take that sheet name and I can move it. There's, we have a bunch of different things on it. We can, you can clear the sheet. You can move it after, before it starts. So there's a whole bunch of things you can do to actual sheets. Oops, let's try that again. So what I've done is I just created an array. I said, okay, January through December. I'm gonna run through those, I'm gonna loop through those sheet names, those months and put it in the sheet name. And then I'm going to grab the sheet name, January, February, March, April, and just keep moving it to the end. And this will actually sort them for me. So let's try that again. Now, when I open the sheet, notice all the tabs are in, in the order I wanted them. So while I broke this up into two different cells, you can see that this could be just one, um, this can be just one script. And in fact, I'll just comment that out. We'll run that again. We can pre pretend that that's just one big script. So there's all the data and with all the tabs sorted. So that's just some things you can do with this, uh, this module. Any questions before we go on to charting? No, I, 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 just I think you're blowing still. a lot. Yeah, I think you're blowing a lot of people's minds in here. Excellent. That's, uh, I like it when that happens. <laughs> <laughs> so I do have a question and it's yeah. a little bit off topic here. There's something I, I meant to ask you when we got started. So you, you, you sort of painted this picture of like, a curiosity, you know, can I do this and what's possible with Excel? But like, what's your background of your job? Cause I would think this is more than just, I have a, a curiosity in Excel uh, is, do you work in Excel and produce reports as a function of your job um, as like an analyst or something like that? Like, I, like it seems like you have more than just a cu passing curiosity in Excel. Well, that, that's a that's a great question, and and as I, we were talking earlier about, uh, you know, you folks are in the near the research triangle. Uh, I used to be uh, I used to use SAS. I was a SAS coder for years, mm -hmm. 
And um, so data has always been fun. No, I don't, I'm not an analyst and I don't do this as a day job. I love playing with data. So if I can play with data like this and I can, I can slice and dice and pick it apart, it's just a lot of fun. That it's what I like to do. I will produce charts for you know in my job, but it's not my it's not my A to Z job day to day. Okay. Um, you know, I also like doing graphing tools. Um, so anything to do with with that kind of stuff, I've always had fun with. So um, I used to be a capacity planner on a mainframe right? <laughs> way back in the day. That's where I got to learn SAS. Um, and then so using SAS, we used to. Uh, IBM would come in every quarter and they would say, okay, we're here to look at your data to prove that you need to spend $15 million more this month. And then it was my job then to take that same data from our mainframes and then come up with competing analysis to keep them honest. So I used to have fun with SAS was an amazing tool for doing slicing and dicing of information. And then as we moved into the PC world, you know, using things like Lotus one, two, three and Excel, uh, became the tools of choice. So. I've just been enamored with Excel over the decades and then married it with PowerShell. So, so we got to the comment in the chat yeah. that I've been waiting for, which is basically the impression that I get from people whenever they see this tool for the first time. So Dwayne Chang says, why couldn't I find this years ago? Which is every <laughs> time I ever introduce someone to import Excel, like I showed my colleagues one day, I'm like, guys, do you know that we could do this? Because I watched them make CSVs and then save it and you know, turn it into an Excel. And every time you show someone for the first time, not even the advanced stuff that you're doing, just the idea of the zebra coloring, like you mentioned, they go, oh my God, why didn't I find this a couple of years ago? So we got one, we finally got that comment. Excellent. Well, I, I definitely <laughs> appreciate that comment. Um, one of the things that's funny is, you know, I think I started building this tool like five years ago. Uh, I think it was five years ago. And what's interesting is only in like the last year or two, I started looking around. So there's other languages, programming languages, like there's Go, there's Rust, there's Python, and there's several, there's tons more. And only in the last couple of years, I think I started looking around and I started finding, oh, Python has all these Excel capabilities as well. And now what I don't, what I don't know, and I'm not positive, I'm not sure if back when I built this, I'm not sure if the Python tools already had this stuff, <laughs> which kind of really, you know, like I go, if I would have searched for it, I would have been probably made my life that much easier. But then again, I might not have built the module. Um, but yeah, it's like, I don't know why, you know, how you advertise something like this more. Um, I don't know what, you know, how it catches people's eye. But yeah, it's, uh, it's a, I got to say, this grew out of curiosity. It grew organically. And I sit back and go, oh my God, I can't believe it can do all this stuff. And it's, it, it's, it's, it's a testament to Excel. It's a testament to PowerShell. And yes, I glued the pieces together, but um, it, Excel and PowerShell are really a match made in heaven, in my opinion. So, so it's a little off topic here, but yeah. maybe it's a, it's a good point to remember, remind people here is that, you know, um, what happens with my group, uh, or I should say our group, Phil, me and the other guys, and, your, and I'm sure this happens with your group as you talk to people, you have a lot of presenters that have some name recognition and you have everyday guys and girls that come and they're like, I could never do that or I could never present. But this is a module that's basically built because someone in the community saw a need and basically explored his curiosity and built upon what he knew. And much of this module Doug built, but then a lot of it has come from other people in the community that saw the need and the possibilities and worked together here. So like when we talk about community in our meetings sometimes, this module is such a fantastic example of the idea of open source community, putting your work out there and letting others putting something in there, right? So just the right to remind people watching at home and in our group that, you know, cultivate those ideas. They really can turn into something special. You do have the ability to do a lot of great stuff. So, and here's a perfect example of a module that started with an idea out of curiosity. And is really, like I said, when I started, for me, this is like the default module that I install after I get on a box because I just use it every day. So imagine the possibilities with the tools that you're using where you can take them. And, and, that, and that's a great point to highlight that. Um, in addition, like a lot of the folks that did the contributions, uh, folks contributed uh, documentation, which was super awesome. Folks contributed like areas that we weren't, that I wasn't covering in doing testing. Um, folks contributed examples and, and, you know, you know, guys, folks like James O'Neill, you know, he's clearly an advanced coder. So he was able to get into the code and, and, and 
pick apart the crazy things I was doing and then say, hey, let's take it in this direction. Let's take it in that direction. And there's, you know, so there's across the, across the spectrum of what you can contribute. And then I also like going into other modules myself and, and help people with their, or help. I could try to do pull requests and I contribute to what they do just so they can get, you know, they may take it, maybe they don't take it. They say why they don't like it. And I go, sure, thanks, no problem. If you want to use it, great. Um, so it, it helps the community. It, it, it helps their creativity, helps my creativity. So yeah, getting up on GitHub and looking around for GitHub modules and PowerShell stuff, or getting on the gallery and looking at it, you're going to find things out there that like, oh my God, this has been out there for 10 years. How come I haven't known about it? Um, you got to do some research. And, and, and people have strengths and weaknesses too, right? Because, exactly. um, um, so Doug may love to do this stuff, but maybe Doug's strong point is not the documentation. Like he said, I'll, I just came across a module last week. I was working with um, Jonathan Moss, who's in our meeting tonight, and we were talking about this module. It's going to remain nameless. Fantastic module. The worst documentation I've ever seen, right? But that's a lot of guys like to write code. They don't like to write examples and help files, right? So there's things for everybody to do. You don't have to be writing amazing code to make a, make a difference. Yeah. Uh, I'm sorry I, I digress here. No, that's, that's perfect. And just to dovetail on that, when I first built this, you know, I didn't know where it was going to go anywhere. And I'm, I'm very much what they call, um, I, I go through what they call YAGNI coding. And I'll spell that for you. Y-A-N-G-I. YAGNI. You ain't going to need it. Wait, did I spell it right? YAGNI. Let's spell it right. YAGNI. So that's a concept that you do in object-oriented programming or when you do software development. YAGNI. You ain't going to need it. That means why am I going to why am I going to invest my time in building this thing out, which you know I think it's really cool, but maybe it's never going to get used, so I wasted my time. And when I first built this, that's how I saw documentation, which is why I built examples but not documentation. And I I got dragged over to coals by so many people. Um, there's no documentation in it. How do you use it? I'm like, well, here's the examples. You know, if you like it, try it out. Um, and still, this thing picked up momentum. So. And then people got on board and helped me out with the docs. And then I didn't. And I said, all right, I'll start working with the documentation as well. So, yeah, there's different people's strengths. You bring the community together, you can build some great things. Doug? I, yeah. Doug, um, you've got the, the, command, the commandlet name add worksheet. Yeah. Is there, is there another commandlet that just references, uh, references the worksheet or like modify worksheet or something like that? Uh, I'm not sure that you're actually – adding a worksheet is as what in this particular case you're just moving it to the end you're you're reordering the worksheets as opposed to actually adding a worksheet that's correct so the way the add worksheet is uh if it exists it doesn't do anything if it doesn't exist it creates it oh it's sense? like an uh, it's like an upsert in C there you go and, exactly yeah yeah okay okay so that and then I get to say, oh, that's an old mainframe trick I used to, I knew. So we used to have things like, you know, oh, yeah. if you want to create tables, right, if the table's not, there's ways that you can say, you know, upsert a table. So you can say, okay, if it doesn't there, create it for me. So yeah. we took the same, took the same approach with that. Yes. Yeah. Were you using uh, Merrill's, Merrill's library for SAS? Oh, my goodness. We have somebody who goes back in the day. Yes. <laughs> um, I used hey, boys, to get a room. <laughs> I'm kidding. I'm kidding. We're gonna start geeking out on the old stuff. Yeah, Dr. Merrill was like one of my uh, one of the gods, and I I used to go to conferences, and I would used to be able to get the chance to talk to him. Uh, guy was oh, brilliant. It's He's wonderful amazing. stuff. Yeah. yeah but no, this anyway, is, thank this you, is... thank thank you. I'm gonna step I uh, step back and not not geek out in the, uh, being an old mainframer. <laughs> no no problem. And uh, we should Mike and folks should actually set up a night. We can have uh, a geek out fest for mainframers. Anyway, moving on. So let's talk about charting because charting is a fun part of data. So, um, so is everybody getting tired? Because I got there's only 20 minutes to, to, till 10 p.m. Um, keep going, keep going. We'll, we'll keep doing it. So now, what I'm going to do here is I'm going to just, you know, I'm going to create. Here's a this is a CSV file inside of a here doc or here string. I'm using my Python terminology, and I'm going to convert it from CSV, and I'm going to store it in data. Okay, so I'm just going to take this basic information and convert it into a PowerShell array with properties. I'm going to use some splatting. And what I'm going to do, create the name of the file I want to use. I want to turn auto filtering on true, auto sizing, auto name range, which we'll talk about. And I'm going to show the file. So now I'm going to take this exact, this same data, and I have a function called new Excel chart definition. 
and I'm going to say the, the X is product and the Y is price. Notice I'm using the names. I don't have to tell it what column it is. That's a feature of auto name range. So when this data gets passed across the pipeline, since I know what everything is inside of Export Excel, I can then set up the Excel spreadsheet to do named ranges that way. And then you can use these different functions based on names and not rather than doing like on column C or column D and stuff like that. We're going to add a title to the, uh, let's add a title to uh, the chart. I don't want a legend and I can also control the size, the height of the chart. Uh, so we'll do that. I'm going to splat the basic parameters and I'll pass in the Excel chart definition. So let's see what we get from here. And there we go. A nice simple chart. Notice we have also filtering. So if I wanted to filter, uh, I just want to see hammers. Let's get this right. Hammers and saws. And notice that the chart actually reflects it as well, which is one of the cool things about what Excel does, right? Um, so we have all kind of that interactivity. Auto name range. This is what I set up once you by specifying that switch. So now if I click product, it can actually show you what it is. It shows you what the uh, range of that particular name is. So if there were 500 rows, it would select everything. If it was on a different sheet, it would take you there as well. So that's when you set things up inside of Excel, this is one of the capabilities of Excel that's really slick. So that's the basic charting. Let's go play with some more. Let's do multiple charts. So we're going to take the same data, but now I'm going to create three charts. Uh, I'm going to do uh, item price, total sales, and sales volume. X range is going to be all the products, but I'm going to, I want to see price, total, quantity over those. So I'm going to create three separate ones. And notice on the total, I can, I can tell it what row and what column to put the chart, or I can just tell it what row. Uh, and then we're going to do an export Excel, auto filtering, auto names, auto size, and then Excel chart definition takes an array of ch uh, chart definitions. And we'll show it once it's been created. So there we have it. So now I have same data, three different charts. What's really cool is, let me see if the next one, yeah, let's, uh, you can also do, let's see how, You can also do chart type, and I surface all the chart types. You can pick whatever you want. So let's go with a, um, a pie chart, 3D exploded. I don't know how that's going to look, but let's uh, run. So now I've changed that first chart to a pie chart, so you can mix and match charts and do some really cool stuff. All right. Any questions? Moving on. You can also, I just recently, in the last year, I guess, added some uh, trend lines. So you can actually grab this data, different set of data. Once again, we're going to do the auto name range. We're going to create the chart definition for region total sold. We're going to do a column clustered, no legend, and we're going to ask, we're going to add a chart trend line. And there's different kinds of trend lines. Again, those get surfaced as well, so you don't have to look it up inside of Excel. And this one comes out kind of okay, but now I can see that I have a nice trend line and you can mix match play around with that to your heart's content as well until you get the report that you would like to see. All right. Pivot tables. Oh, super slice and dice. Uh, I'm not going to describe what pivot, pivot tables are, but if you were a SAS coder, this is called cross tabs. Um, super slick. We won't go down the discussion of OLAP and stuff like that. Uh, Power BI has these kind of things. Um, Let's see how it works inside of uh, with PowerShell and Excel. Again, I'm going to grab some basic target data, right? Company name and handles off the process. I'm going to export it, auto size it, show it. Now I'm going to use a bunch of switches, include a pivot table. I'm going to also include a pivot chart. And what I want to do is I want to pivot based on the company and I want to pivot on the data. I want to sum the handles. All right. So let's run this, take a look at what it is. And this does two cool things which I like better than what Python does. Not only do we get all the data, right? So this is all the data that I, we piped across, but notice I have another sheet down here called sheet one pivot table. So what pivot, this pivot table does is since I said, I'll make it a little smaller. I don't know if this is more readable. So you can see down here, here's company. So by telling pivot, the pivot table that I wanna do uh, based on company, it actually does a unique 
And then it goes ahead and says, oh, you want to sum handles? Okay, I'm going to find out all the Microsoft, all these unique values. I'm going to sum up all the values for you. And then we're going to apply a chart to it. And that's how hard it is to do pivot tables inside of PowerShell with PowerShell and Excel. Let's kick that example up a notch. We're just going to show a different, uh, we can also get chart types on that, which gets surfaced as the tab completion. We'll run that one, get the data, and you get the nice little chart, eye-popping charts. This is always gets management. Now, if you give this to somebody, what's kind of cool if they know how to use pivot tables, right? They can actually come in here and I can grab name under pivot table. And now I can see, oh, all the different stuff that Microsoft, all the names of the processes running on my machine. And this data is not limited to just looking at what's on your machine. You can have data coming from SQL. You can have data from REST services, from JSON, from CSVs, wherever you can pull data from you can then easily pump it into Excel and get pivot tables. All right, remove that. We're getting uh, close. To, yeah. I mean, this is really amazing code that you have here. I mean, the simplicity to do these things with just a few simple lines of code. I mean, it's really, well, <laughs> really well yeah. done. Thank you. Uh, yeah, and it, it was basically done, you know, as I started playing and building this, I am, I'm a definitely a lazy coder. So one of the reasons why it is this simple is I didn't want to jump through all kinds of hoops to make this stuff happen. Um, so yeah, and, and, and at the end of the day, it's kind of cool. Let's take a look at this. Multiple pivot tables. I like this one as well. Um, so this one's a little more involved, but let's just take a quick look at it um, and then we'll run it. So we're going to grab our standard data. Uh, because CSV files comes in as text, I'm converting the date field here. I'm going to convert it to an actual date so that Excel knows that it is a date and gets stored correctly. Um, and then I'm going to splat some basic information about pivot tables. Uh, we've seen it before, rows, data, et cetera. You can, you can set the style of table you want. And then there's some all extra features that you can do. You can do group rows. You can do a group date row. And then Excel recognizes that it, as a date, and you'll see some of the magic it does. And the parts that I want to see about the date are the years and the quarters. So I do that, and I, and I splat that, and then I come down and I want to say, well, I don't want to just do it by region. I want to do it by fruit. So I can just take that same splatted hash table, and I can just set a couple of more parameters. I want to say, okay, put this pivot table in J1, and I want to do fruit region date. Put this one in N1, do date region fruit, so on and so forth. So I set up about four or five different pivot tables on the same sheet, not a separate sheet, and then I close it and we're good to go. So let's run this and see what magic we get. So there we go. So now I've got four pivot tables based on the same data. Okay. And notice this one is notice how the I did not I did not do anything magical with this with the year and the quarter. That's telling PowerShell that this is a date and I want the I want the the year and the quarters, and then power my Excel says, sure, no problem. And then we can just pivot the data in different ways. I want to see it by fruit and and and, and region. Here I want to see it just by year and by uh, by the dates for the year and the quarter. And then the last one's just a little bit different with no quarter showing. And these are all live pivot tables. So if I wanted to come in here, I could sort, I can then select information on here. This is this is the map. This is the magic of um, Excel, right? And if I started sorting this information, this will get reflected. So there's some really cool things you can do. Yes, it gets more complex. All depends on what you're doing. All depends on the audience. That's multiple pivot tables. And notice it's all on one sheet. So you can put all your data, all your pivot tables, and you can add charts uh, if you wanted to as well. All right. So let's, uh, let's see how much time we got. Some time. All right. So I'm going to, I don't know if you've heard, uh, uh, know, uh, you probably know Jacob. I can't pronounce his last name. He, uh, he, he, he's the person, who, he's the guy that uh, maintains PS Pester, PowerShell Pester, the testing framework. And uh, the other week, he came up with a way to do profiling. So what does that mean? So I don't know how many people are familiar with the measure command. So here I'm just taking, doing from one to a million, I want to do a for each. And I want to set a variable and say, okay, take each value and just multiply it by two. Measure command is going to show me how long that takes. It should take a couple of seconds. Okay. So measure command, which comes out of the box of PowerShell, right? So that this 
button right here took about three seconds to run. That's cool. Now, what if I have a bunch of uh, a script where a bunch of lines of code, I, I do this kind of a for each, I look this up, I do this query, so on and so forth. So here I am going to do a get process, select the first five um, processes, and I'm gonna export it to Excel, and then I'm just gonna delete the file. But I'm gonna use the new his new profiler mechanism, and I'm gonna say trace the script instead of doing a measure script. And we're gonna see what happens. Let's run that. And then this is the output that shows how he's running, he's figuring out flows, he's getting the top 50, so on and so forth. So now dollar trace, has the results from that trace script. And if I do it this way, this is what it shows me. Trace, do the top 50 duration. It's really tough data to read, but basically it's showing like the average time it's spent inside of that piece of code, the duration, how many, how much does this account for the entire run of that script? And I said, well, you know what? I'm gonna take that same data, right? And I'm gonna put it in, in PowerShell. I'm sorry, I'm gonna use uh, ex export Excel I'm gonna do some calculation. I'm just gonna do some formatting of his data. Uh, I'm gonna create a new chart definition, two of them. I wanna see a hit count chart and a duration. And I'm gonna export it to Excel. I'm gonna do a pass through, which then re saves the data, but then I can work with that object model. Uh, I'm gonna change the width on column A. I'm gonna do some number formatting. And then I'm gonna add some data bars in the hit, hit count. Um, column. So all this boring data here, I'm going to take this data and run it through Excel and create some charts. So that's that same exact data. And then here's what a data bar looks like. Oh, that's did somebody, fantastic. Did somebody pass out? Are you okay? okay. I think that's <laughs> Phil. Uh, I was like, so, Ooh. so now I'm all, now I'm getting charts, right? So I can actually, you know, this is tough. I, I would actually crunch this data and summarize it a little bit bit deeper I just wanted to go really easy but I can see where the duration is and then I can actually see where the hit counts are and the data bar is really slick um, that you can uh, you can see right off the bat like which one's the most like okay why is this one getting hit 25 times oh and I happen to know that okay it, that's in the script header so that's when I calculate the script headers to put it up in the, in the, in the top here so okay that makes sense and it doesn't take that much time uh, and it even tells me what line of code it is. That's based on the profile of Jockham's work. Um, so yeah, so you marry his output with Excel, all of a sudden you get some really interesting things, and then it might give you some ideas of like how you'd want to take your data and what you can do with it. And again, you've got the filtering turned on automatically, so you can do all kinds of really neat stuff. So this is from the trace object from earlier. That's right? from this, this, this data, data from the trace script, got exactly. It. Yeah, okay. So you can think about it, any other kind of data that you have that does this kind of stuff. You can do yes. some really cool magic, right? It's a PS object, yeah. Yeah, there you go. Does, so, does his uh, measurement give you the ability to capture a median um, as, still, as opposed to average? Uh, good question. I don't I don't think he's, uh, I don't know the full amount of, um, and let's pipe that to get member, comment that out. So he does average, no, he doesn't do that calculations, but I know he's, he's constantly working on this and putting out new versions. And I'm sure that he's, you know, he's, he will probably consider doing a media and so on and so forth. I wouldn't, I would bet that he's working. And what's really, here's what's really cool. This is up in GitHub. This is up on PowerShell gallery. You can find his, um, I'm not gonna look for it now, but you can find his module up on GitHub take a look at his issues and say, hey, if you don't see it, you'd like to say, hey, I'd like to ask if you could do a median calculation. And it goes on his backlog and he can choose to implement it or not, or you can look at his code and implement it for him. Makes sense? So, the other thing I wanted to show too, I just recently did this. Um, so if you use Visual Studio Code, I created a PowerShell Excel snippet, okay? So snippets are part of, I, you can do snippets in ICE, you can do snippets inside of um, Visual Studio Code. So I created some, I'll show you what they look like. And you can then just download this from, uh, the, the, let's see, you can just download this from uh, the gallery or from the marketplace on Visual Studio Code. So I'm gonna open up another code and we'll take a look at extensions 
So I'm looking at the extensions that are installed on my Visual Studio Code locally in yeah, Excel. So I have this one installed, so it shows that it, I can uninstall it, but it's ready to go. And how this works is I'll create a new file and I'll set the language to PowerShell because it only can work in PowerShell. And if you type in PS hyphen, Oh, the demo gods are going to get me tonight. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, everything. There we go. Got the console coming up now. It should work. I hope. Oops. PS hyphen. There we go. So what's cool is these are all the different uh, snippets I've built. And I use these and made them available to the community. So notice I clicked on this little thing here. It shows you what the snippet is and gives you a little help of what it does. Right. And so, for example, Here's a PS uh, Excel. So if you just, you can select it, hit tab, right? And then you can just run it to see how it works, okay? What else is cool about this is, you can also type PS EX export because it has a fuzzy search. So you see all the blue letters that are highlighted? So I didn't even type out what I wanted, but it finds it anyway. So there's a PXL export, right? And I have something in here called sample like I like to set up sample data. And what this does is I can now select this as a, I can I will select the text and then I can go back and I can type in the PS Excel export. And what it does is notice it, it kept the selected area. So not only does it give you a default get service, but as now as I'm typing away and I'm, you know, creating a bunch of data, you know, I can then say, okay, I just want to grab that and then export Excel and I'm good to go. So it just, back to what Mike was saying where he has a bunch of stuff in his profile, I've taken that as well and made snippets inside of PS Code, VS Code, if it's a, the editor of your choice, obviously. Um, and you can do things like open package, you can do imports, uh, conditional formatting I set up for you with an example. And all of these work where you can actually select your data and then you're good to go. Notice also, you can do tab stops within the snippet. So I set up tab stops in it. Try it again. Uh, PS, which one did I just do? Conditional formatting. Oops. So you see the tab stops, I can tab to, so you can change, well, what do you want to do? Run, and then I can tab again. I can change the name of the file to whatever. Anyway, so if you want, if you're inside of, um, that's like code. a that's like a whole presentation on its own. That thing is so cool. <laughs> yes, it is, and it would be a whole presentation on its own to show you how to build one. Which is, uh, I should just should, yeah, we we should do it a whole separate one on on snippets because this is the this is the way that you get it out into the world. But there's ways that you can build snippets for yourself, which are really easy and just on your machine or just for your projects. But that's a talk of another time. All right, all right, it's ten o'clock. Wow, I can't believe. It. Um, let's just end it with. So there's, uh, if you want, you want to catch up with me, I'm on Twitter. You can check out my YouTube uh, channel. Um, not only do I have my meetups there um, for the New York City PowerShell group, uh, but I also put up uh, videos. I think I have a video of the PowerShell snippets in action, just a short one on, on doing those snippets in action. I've got other stuff on how to use interactive notebooks. So you might want to check my channel out because I do a lot of these kind of videos and put them out there. You can check out my GitHub. Uh, on my GitHub repos, uh, where I have all these and many other uh, experiments and things that I put live in the PowerShell gallery. Uh, and you can check out my blog, uh, where I blog about these different topics. And uh, thanks for having me. Oh, so Doug, this was ph phenomenal, ph fantastic. Um, so I, there's a lot of chat. I told you this was a talkative group and nobody said anything tonight, but the, the chat was on fire with awesome. people really enjoying this. So I think they just were drinking in from the fire hose and really absorbing it. Um, super fantastic module. I feel like I should say thank you. You've helped all of us in the community out to do better work in our jobs with what seems like commercial quality code in an open source module. And let's all remember that Doug is doing this with his own time for no compensation. So kudos to you. This is a fantastic piece of software. Thanks for sharing it with us tonight. And thanks for having me. Thanks for the kind words. And I'm glad. Uh, and please find me on Twitter. I would love to hear how you're using it. Send me an email. Put something on my GitHub uh, issues. Say, hey, this is great. This is what 
it, it helps the community, helps me uh, make it. If you can contribute stuff, it makes everybody better. It'd be awesome. Thank you. Uh, so if you've made it this far into the video and you're watching this at home, for thank you for joining us. We have uh, over 95 other videos on topics just like this. Anything related to PowerShell is covered in our group as well as Doug Pinky's group. Please check out the other videos available in the channel. We'd love to have you come and join us live for the, for the next meeting. If you're curious, you can find out about Doug's group or our group on meetup.com. Doug is the leader of the New York City PowerShell group. And with the Research Triangle PowerShell group, both of us can be found on Meetup. And we meet uh, regularly each month. We'd love to have and join you in person so you can participate in the next meeting. So with that, we're going to say thank you for joining us tonight. And have a, have a nice time, everyone. We'll see you soon.